about y'all welcoming our speaker for this week, Jeff Eisenhower. Let him know you're glad to have him here this evening. God bless you, Thank Jeff. You, All right, man. Don't you love your pastor? Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise for Brother Mike. Love that brother, man. Nothing I wouldn't do for him, nothing he wouldn't do for me. So we go around doing nothing for each other. I mean, we really do. Love you, brother. Hey, listen, these two, these two old boys, they're watching the uh, 11 o'clock news at night. And, and there's a story about a guy getting ready to jump off a bridge. One old boy looks at that and said, I bet you $50 he don't jump. That boy said, I bet you $50 he does. He said, you're wrong. Well, they watched the story, and sure enough, sadly enough, the guy did jump off the bridge. Old boy reaches in his bill phone and said, well, here you go. He said, no, man. He said, keep your money. He said, that's not fair. He said, I saw that same news program at 6 o'clock today. And the other boy said, well, I did too, but I sure didn't think he'd do it again. Uh, you know, so uh, how, how many of you want God to do again what he did this morning? Come on, some of us say amen. Amen? Yeah, I, I do too, man. I, I want him to see you do it again. Uh, this, this is a couple. Uh, they go into a um, pet store. And uh, they're walking around, they're looking for a pet, and, and the guy hears this voice in the back of the pet store go, Mister, hey, Mister. And he looks around, and he, you know, he, he didn't see anybody around him. There's not another person. Here's the voice again, Mister, hey, Mister. Well, he, he walks in, he looks, and he sees a parrot in a cage. And he looks at him, and the parrot says, Mister, hey, Mister. And the guy looks around, and he says, What? He said, your wife. He said, yeah, well, what about her? And the parrot said, she's ugly. Well, this offended the guy. I mean, he just couldn't, you know. So he goes back, he goes to the front, he tells the manager, he said, you got a parrot back there that said that my wife is ugly, and I'm highly offended. We're getting ready to leave the store. He said, sir, don't leave, don't go back. Don't, don't. Now, he said, I, I've told him not to do that anymore. So the manager goes back there and takes the bird and kind of shapes him around in the cage a little bit and slaps him across the beak and puts him back in there. And he says, I told you, don't you ever do that again. And uh, he looks at the man, and he said, sir, he said, listen, please don't leave. He said, I, we, we've taken care of it. He said, he, d he don't, you know, he don't know what he's talking about. He said, okay. So they're walking around about five more minutes, and he hears a voice, mister. Hey, mister. And the guy looks at the parrot, and he says, what? And the parrot looks at him and says, you know what? You know, so, uh, you know, when, when, it, when, it, when it comes to, to those of us that go to church a lot, uh, and, we, and we start studying the Bible, and we start talking about scriptures that we've heard over and over and over again, we kind of have like a you-know-what attitude, like, like we've heard it all, like there's nothing new. Now, what, what we're going to do is I'm going to do on the same vein, kind of like what I did this morning, and we're going to take a very familiar passage of scripture, uh, and, uh, and we're going to look at it, but I want you to see it in, in a different way. Uh, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 15. And it is the story of the prodigal son, but it's not going to be like you think. And, we're not, and I'm not going to share it in a way that you probably have a eh, been there, done that, you know what kind of attitude. Uh, so we're going to examine uh, the story of the, the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. Now, in order to understand the parable of the prodigal son, you've got to start with Luke chapter 15. And verse 1, uh, because that's vital, that's foundational to everything that Jesus is getting ready to talk about in the entire chapter of Luke chapter 15. So let's go to Luke 15, verse 1. Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him, talking about Jesus, to hear him. Isn't that amazing? The people that were nothing like Jesus are the only ones that really liked Jesus. And so they all drew near to him to hear him, and the Pharisees and the scribes, that's the religious people, the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners, and he eats with them. Now, now keep that in mind, because everything that Jesus is going to teach has to do with that foundation of where Jesus is. It has to do with the context that Jesus is eating with these Pharisees, I mean, he's eating with these tax collectors and sinners. By the way, You'll notice tax collectors and sinners, two different categories, because tax collectors in the Jewish mind were worse than any other sinners that there were. And so, so here is Jesus with these tax collectors and sinners, and here are the religious people of Jesus' day. Here are these religious men, the scribes and the Pharisees, and they're complaining like religious people will do. 
He, they're complaining that Jesus receives sinners and he eats with them. And so he's going to share three parables, uh, and you know them well, but keep in mind, all three of these parables are related to what we just read in Luke 15, 1 and 2. Now, now you, you'll see what I'm talking about. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, it says, So, now, now so, so, here, so here's Jesus. Uh, he's with the tax collectors. He's with the sinners. Pharisees are complaining. So in verse 3, it says, So, he spoke a parable unto them. And then he gives the parable of the hundred sheep and the shepherd who leaves the ninety-nine and goes after the one. So we, we know that parable. But, it, but keep in mind, it's linked to what we find out that Jesus is doing in verse 1. So now look at verse 8. Go down to verse 8. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, and we, we have the, the parable of the lost coin, a woman who loses a coin, she sweeps the house, and she finds it, she rejoices that she found it. So uh, the, 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 the 99, the 100 sheep, the 99, that's linked to 15, verse 1 and 2. Verse 8, or what woman, and then go down to verse 11, and he said a certain man had two sons. So, so all of these parables, the, uh, the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son are all tied to the fact that tax collectors and sinners, the people that were nothing like Jesus, were the ones that really liked Jesus, and the religious people of his time didn't like that. So keep that, keep that in mind. Now, so we find that this parable is tied to chapter 15, verse 1, and to and understand this, the parable of the prodigal son, now listen to me, has always been about two sons. Now, we, 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 uh, most preachers will, will preach about the prodigal son and, and talk about the prodigal son. But, but the parable of the prodigal son is really not accurate. It's the parable of the prodigal sons. There are two boys, and it's always been about it. You go back to verse 11, and he said, a certain man had two sons. So it's, it's, it's always, always been about two sons. Now, normally, uh, we'll preach about the prodigal son uh, of being lost. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I've, I've done that many times. Uh, and we talk about, you know, I, he once was lost, and now he's found. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's good. But the bottom line is that's really not what that parable is about. Uh, it's, it's okay to, to use that to try to reach lost people. But the parable of the prodigal son has never been about somebody who was lost and has come into the kingdom of God. Uh, because keep in mind, he's always, been in the, he's always been in the family. Now, yeah, he's rotten to the core uh, because basically what the prodigal son does, uh, he knows he has an inheritance, so he goes to his dad, and basically what he tells his dad, he said, Dad, you are living too long. Why don't you die? Now, that'll bless you. Can I get an amen, all right? I mean, you got a kid that tells you, why don't you just die? Uh, you know, that that because uh, I, I need my inheritance, and you're taking too long to die, so go ahead and give me what, what belongs to me. Now, but the bottom line is, he's in the family. He's always been in the family. The father's always been his father. And even though he doesn't deserve it, uh, the father, uh, you know, even though the prodigal son is no good, his father is good. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's none of us that are any good, but how many of you say a big amen? Our Heavenly Father is always good. And so this is what this is about. Uh, it's about two boys. Now, he's in the family, uh, and he's no good, uh, but his father is good, and his father never kicks about the family. Uh, he's, when he comes back, he's still, in, he's still in the right standing with the family. Now, uh, but this parable is about two sons, and mainly, believe it or not, because of what we find out that Jesus was doing in chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, hanging out with sinners, this parable really is about the older brother. So tonight, I want to speak just for a moment about the warning of the older brother syndrome. Now, let's go down, go to Luke chapter 15, and go with me, uh, please, to verse 25. Let's, let's talk about this older brother just, just for a moment. All right, uh, Luke 15, and beginning at verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and he came and he drew near to the house, and he heard music 
and dancing. Now, by the way, I get that you can hear music at a party, but brother, anybody say amen to this? When you hear dancing at a party, man, that's a party. Can I get an amen? You know what I'm saying? So, so they heard music and dancing. I mean, they were getting with it, man. They were, everybody was happy. They were dancing. Verse 26, so he called one of the servants and asked, what do these things mean? He said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father killed the fatted calf. And he was angry. He wouldn't go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. And so he answered and he said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry of my friends. But as soon as this son of yours has come, he devoured his livelihood with harlots. You killed the fatted calf for him. Now, I'm telling you, that's exactly what he sounded like. Now, I can't prove it, but I have a feeling that's what he sounded like. You ever met anybody like that? Uh, now, it's true. Uh, this older brother has been faithful. Uh, this older brother was holding down the fort. This older brother was out working in the fields while his younger brother, we find out, wasted his inheritance. And all of that is true. No doubt about it. Now, listen to me. Tonight, be honest, which one of these two brothers can you best relate to? Because you see, I know who's here tonight. You're the Sunday night crowd. Uh, this is not my first rodeo. Uh, at, 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 and I know your pastor, your pastor, bless his sweetheart. He's over there. He said, man, he said, we're, we're thin tonight. We're thin. We had such a great morning. And I'm, Pastor Jeff, I don't know. We're just thin. I said, brother, listen, I've done revivals when if I said dearly beloved, it would sound like a proposal. I said, don't you worry about it. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? I said, man, don't you worry about it. I said, we got here who I believe God really wants here. Now, l l listen to me. If anything is going to be done radically, if anything's going to be done at Trading Forward Baptist Church, you are the guy that God's going to use to do it. Because you're here. Because I have a feeling that most of you would be here if we decided to have the meeting tonight at 1 o'clock in the morning. Many of you would be here. Because that's just the way you are. That's who you are. And because of that, because you're here tonight, then I want to encourage you and say thank you for coming tonight, but also to give all of us that have known Jesus for a while, to give all of us a little bit of warning about the older brother syndrome. You see, the longer that you are a believer, uh, you become an older brother. And uh, then... If you're an older brother or an older sister, then you and I, that have been saved for a while, we've got to be on guard and make sure we don't develop an older brother syndrome. Pl plain and simply, the older brother syndrome is this. Thinking that I'm better than those sinners out there and also thinking that others are worse off than I am. That's an older brother syndrome syndrome and it's easy to do it's easy that those of us who have been saved for a while because i'm telling you i don't know i don't know maybe, maybe it's me can, can, do i have any kin folk here tonight i think i'm going crazy and the reason why i think i'm going crazy is because lately i find myself yelling at my tv can, can i get a <laughs> what are they thinking what what are they doing what in whose world does anybody think this is sane and right? Am I, am I the only one? And it's so easy for those of us that know Jesus and know the Word of God and know, and know what can be and should be in Christ. It's easy for all of us, me included, especially me. I've been an older brother for a long time to develop an older brother syndrome, to, uh, to think, those sinners out there, man, they're, they're too far gone and that I'm not as bad as they are. Now, I want to take a look at three effects very quickly 
uh, of the older brother syndrome. And then I'm going to finish up, though. Don't, don't, don't turn me off. Hang on to the end because I'm going to need a cure for it. So I'm going to get three effects. Then I'm going to finish up with a cure. Number one, the older brother syndrome affects the way we see ourselves. Now, if you have an older brother syndrome, you, it affects the way you see yourself. Look at verse 29. In verse 29, the older brother said, I have never neglected a command of yours. Literally, he said, I have never transgressed at any time. Ladies and gentlemen, no human being can ever say that. No human being, unless you're full of pride, nobody can say, I have never messed up. I'm telling you right now, right now, everybody in this room has messed up. Am I talking to anybody that has messed up, somebody say amen, amen? And if you're here tonight and you say, well, not me, I didn't mess up, you just did. Yeah. Amen? Ain't nobody, listen, I love you people, you have treated me so well since I've been here in just a couple of hours, and I love your pastor, but I'm telling you right now, ain't nobody at Trading Forward Baptist Church or any other Baptist church at the church I pastor, nobody has it all together. And all God's people said, the only person that has it all together is the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're going to mess up if you look and compare yourself. Listen, I can always find somebody that I can compare myself to, but when I compare myself to Jesus, I woefully fall short of his glory. And if we're not careful, we, uh, we, we, it affects the way we see ourselves. The older brother said, I've never transgressed you at any time. That's a lie. And he knows it. There have been times he messed up too. Uh, now, Luke 18, Jesus tells us what the root of this kind of pride really is. In, in Luke 18, verse 9, just l listen to it as I read it. Jesus says this. He also spoke, spoke a parable to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and ended up despising others. That's the root of pride. Trusting in yourself and despising others. You see, righteousness means, simply means the right standing before God. That's, that's, that's what it means. And, and, and I can never place my, myself in my, in, in my own right standing before God. I can never be good enough. I've, uh, I've, always, I've all messed up, and we've all messed up, and nobody has it all together. You see, here's, here's what I want you to see. There are two people. Two groups of people in the world that are in danger of self-righteousness. Now, the first group we know about, that's lost people. Uh, that's, the, that, that's the people who think they're good enough or they can work their way. Yeah, lost people are in danger of self-righteousness. You, you, listen, you know what I hear all the time? And, and you hear it all the time. I hear it all the time. Pe people say, well, you know, preacher, I, I, I don't go to church because the, the church is full of a bunch of Come on, say it out loud. A bunch of what? Hypocrites. You know what my answer to that is? You better believe it. We are. But I'm going to tell you something. There's always room for one more. Amen? I mean, you know. And here's the deal. Here's the deal. Food line is full of hypocrites. That don't stop you from buying groceries and all God's people's head. Yeah, the church is full of hypocrites. Aaron Lake Baptist Church has a pastor that's a hypocrite. Do not say amen right now. <laughs> but it's true. Sure, we're all hypocritical. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. That, listen, if, if this is, that we, we have a church where no perfect people are allowed. You think you're perfect, man, you're just not going to feel welcome at our church. Listen, we're all messed up. Turn to the person right beside you right now and say, you're messed up. Go ahead, tell them, you're messed up. Now, now some of you really like that. <laughs> some of you have been waiting for years to say that. And nobody ever gave you an opportunity to do it. I just did. Some of you enjoyed that way too much. But we are. Amen? We're all messed up. Uh, listen, lost people are in danger of self-righteousness. But listen, let me tell you, there's another group that's in danger of self-righteousness, and that's older believers. Us older. Now, I'm not talking about in age. Age can have a lot to do with it. But I'm talking about those of us that have known Jesus for a long time. Uh, I, I love the story that, that your pastor shared about that young guy. He showed, me, he showed me that text this morning in the service where he said, what's revival? We tend to think, we, we tend to forget that, don't we? I mean, we, we have our church words. We know, we know what we're talking about, but we forget that the lost world. Listen, when, listen I, I'm telling you, the, the, when I was first saved, uh, 
I knew I didn't have any self-righteousness. When I, when I was first saved, I knew I was a sinner and on my way to a sinner's hell. I didn't know everything that happened to me, but I knew I was lost. Jesus came into my heart and radically changed my life, and I absolutely knew nothing about the Christian life. I mean nothing. I, listen, I pronounced Psalms, Psalms. I didn't know. I, I pronounced Job, Job. And I thought, isn't that awesome? The Bible has a way for me to get a job. And I needed a job because I was a bum. I'm telling you, I knew nothing. I thought John 3.16 was a bathroom on the third floor somewhere. Now, you'll think about that later on tonight. But anyway, so I'm telling you, I knew nothing. But then, started learning the Scriptures. Started getting in church. Started being able to quote the Bible. Listen, listen, come on, come on, come on, come on. Do you remember how you felt when they first asked you to serve? Do do you remember how you felt when somebody said, Hey, listen, we we think think you'd be a good teacher for uh, the third grade boys. And uh, you felt honored. Or, or they, you remember, you remember, come on guys, you, you remember when they first asked you to be a deacon? You remember that? It, it, do, do you remember when they asked you to sing that solo? What was the first thing out of your mouth? I, I don't think I can. I, I don't think I'd be good at it. But, but I'll pray about it. And, and probably you did pray about it. I'm sure you did pray about it. And you were nervous. I mean, you, 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 you told that third grade boys, and, and you should have been nervous because th- they just gave you a suicide mission in the church. I mean, I'm just, you know. But you remember, you remember, you remember what it was like when you sang that solo or you got in the choir and, 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 and said, God, I, I can't do this. Lord, you're going to have to do it through me. Deacon, deacon, come on. My deacon brother, do you remember? What was the first thing when they asked you to be a deacon? You said, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not qualified. I know that's what you said, because you weren't, and you felt that way. But what happens? After a while, and you know this is true, we start getting used to it. And what we used to could only do by the Spirit of God, after a time, now we can do it in the flesh. Sometimes we don't even have to pray about it. We get up there, man, we can just spout it out. We, we, we know it all. We can teach it. We can sing it. We, uh, and you know, what, you know what that does? It, it leads to a spirit of entitlement because you, you get the impression that the older brother felt entitled. He was entitled. Why? Because he was faithful. He stuck with the stuff. He didn't run off, waste his living. He's been there with the father. This is my house. You get the impression he didn't, he didn't, he didn't welcome his brother back because he didn't think his brother belonged there. Matter of fact, he, he didn't say it, but he's kind of had the attitude, what are you doing back at my house? Who do you think you are? You, you, you can become entitled. And, 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 and our churches are full of that. I, I heard, about a, heard about a pastor who's a fairly new pastor, and, and uh, he'd been at church not very long, and, and, uh, and his mother came to hear him preach, and, and nobody had met her before. They didn't know who she was. And so she comes in the back, and one of the deacons, in, uh, uh, one of the ushers in the back, uh, he, he, he said, ma'am, he, he said, um, let, me, uh, l- let, me, let me just, uh, I'll seat you. She said, well, no, I, I'd like to, I would like to come up to the front and, 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 and hear him preach. And he, and he said, ma'am, i got to be honest with you, he's not real good. <laughs> I mean, we love him, but he's not real good. Let me just sit you back here. And she looked at him, she said, do you know who I am? He said, no, ma'am. She said, I am his mother. And he said, ma'am, do you know who I am? She says, no, I don't. He said, good, see you, lady. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so, y- you know, we, 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 get, we get entitled. We get entitled. We think, you, do you know who I am? I'm a charter. Listen, I hear, oh, I hear this. I, hear, I got people in my church. Listen, I've been there 30 years. I've, lived out, I've outlived almost all of them. That's probably why I enjoy it so much. But I'm telling you, every once in a while, well, preacher, I'm a charter member. You know what? So? All that means you've lived a long time. What have you done for Jesus today? Come on, amen? I don't care if you're a charter member. Uh, Listen, listen. 
you, you, you're going to be so glad I'm not your pastor. I'm telling you, because, because this is, this, this is I, now I'm not, I'm not telling you a lie. I'm telling you the truth right now. I'm not preaching. Anyway, so, 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 this, this, so we, had, we had an event. This has been years ago. Uh, we had an event, and it was a youth event. And I, and I told our people, listen, we, we're going to have this group in, and this is for our teenagers. And it's going to be wild, and it's going to be loud, and it ain't going to be your thing. And you're not going to like it. And there's going to be smoke. I mean, there's going to be guitars. There's going to be drums. And I'm telling you, and if that's not your thing, do us all a favor and stay home. I give you a free night home. I don't want you to come. Now, if you want to come, you come so you can bless some teenagers. But I'm telling you, this thing is going to be off the hook. Don't come. Well, sure enough. One of our deacons came, and he didn't like it. And I'm not kidding. The Lord is my witness. The next day, I get a call. My secretary says, Brother so-and-so. I went, uh, let, let, I'm going to let you lend on a little pastoral secret, okay? Your, your pastor won't tell you this. We love you, and we'll do anything for you. But I'm just telling you, there's some of you, we see you come down the hall, we're going to duck in a classroom somewhere. <laughs> Can you get an amen? I mean, I'm just telling you. We're going, if we could hide from you, we will hide from you. Don't mean we won't bury you. Don't mean we won't love you. Don't mean we won't help you. If you're sick, we'll go to the hospital and hold your hand. But I'm telling you, we don't want to talk to you. <laughs> now, he won't tell you that because he's a loving man. I'll tell you that. That's why you brought me in here. <laughs> well, anyway, I kind of rolled my eyes. I knew what was coming. I picked up the phone. I said, hello. And I'm not kidding. He said, what have you done to my church? I said, excuse me? You know what I'm talking about? He said, that was the most ungodly, wild, satanic thing I've ever heard in my life. By the way, it wasn't. I mean, it was all Jesus, man. It was all Jesus. But what have you done to my church? And I, I kid you not, this is what I did. I said, hold on a minute, brother. Let me put you on hold. I put him on hold, made him listen to horrible telephone music <laughs> while I went outside and I walked slow. And I went out to our sign in the front of our church, and I stood there, and I looked at him, just like that. Now, he's still on hold in my office, <laughs> listening to old music. I walk slowly back in. I get to my office. I unhold him. He said, where have you been? I said, I'll tell you where I've been. I've been outside looking on our church sign, and brother, I've looked at that for a long time, and your name ain't on it. And my name ain't on it. Because, by the way, I told him, don't you put my name on this thing. My name ain't on it and your name on it. And I said, brother, I want to tell you something. Whatever you think, this is not your church and this is not my church. And, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, this is not your church. These are not your seats. These are not your instruments. This is not your building. I don't care if your name's on it. It is not your church. It is not my church. It is not Mike's church. It is God's church. You take your hands off of it and let Jesus build his church. And all God's people said, amen. He left. Thank God. <laughs> now, I, I told you you're glad I'm not your pastor. I had people come up to me and say, Brother so-and-so's left. Do you need to go see him? I said, I ain't going to go see him. He's mad at me. You go see him. I said, I ain't stupid. I ain't going to go see a guy that's mad at me. I said, he'd like to shoot me. Y'all go see him. But see, this is an older brother syndrome. The older brother felt entitled. He'd been faithful. I get that. He'd been with the Father. I get that. But he'd been entitled. Number two, the older brother syndrome affects the way we see others. It doesn't just affect the way we see ourselves. But older brother syndrome affects the way we see others. In, in Luke chapter 7, and I'll just give you the story. Th there's, a, there's a story in Luke chapter 7 about Jesus in the home of a Pharisee whose name was Simon. This is not Simon Peter. This is Simon the Pharisee. And in walks this sinful woman. And she starts bathing Jesus' feet. Now, this woman is a sinner. She's probably a, a harlot. And, uh, and so, so Simon, Jesus doesn't stop it. 
And so Simon, the Pharisee, is thinking. Now, he ain't saying anything out loud. He, he's just thinking. And, and in Luke chapter 7, we find out where Simon is thinking, some prophet. If this guy were a prophet like everybody says he is, he would know what kind of woman this is. And, then, and, the, and the scriptures tell us, because she is a sinner. And you can almost hear the background music. Dun, 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 dun. She is a sinner. Jesus turns around. He says, Simon, I got something to say to you. Hey, by the way, that's pretty good prophet when he can read your mind. Amen? He said, I got something to say to you. He said, what is it? And then Jesus starts telling him a story about uh, a, a man that uh, lended some two guys some money. One was 500 denarii, which is 500 days wage, and one 50, 50 days wage. And he wiped the slate clean. And, and didn't, didn't hold either one of them to account. He said, now let me ask you something. Which one was more thankful? And Simon said, well, I guess the guy that owed 500. He said, you answered right. Now, G listen, Jesus is not saying that those of us that were in deep sin because we've been forgiven, that we should love Jesus more. That's not what he's saying. The whole point of the parable is Jesus is telling Simon, listen, what you need to be on guard of is that you think you are better than somebody else. That we've all sinned. And we all have a debt that we couldn't pay. And Jesus paid our debt that he didn't owe. And all God's people said. Uh, then, um, lastly, the older brother syndrome affects the way we see the father. Not, not only does it affect the way I see myself, not only does it affect the way I see others, but it affects the way I see the Father. You see, if we're not careful, we're so focused on how good we're doing and, and how faithful we are and what we do around here. And this church can't do without me. That we fail to see how good the Father is doing. Let me, let me tell you, every day, the older brother saw his father go out over the hill looking for his wayward child. Now, you would think that the older brother would say, I've got such a good father. He loves his kids so much. If it were me, he'd be doing the same thing for me. But he loves my brother so much, he's looking for him every single day. My, my, my younger brother don't deserve that. My younger brother... You know, he, uh, he basically told my dad, I wish you were dead, but my father is looking for me every day. You, know, you would think, he would say, what a good father. But no, 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 he didn't do that. As a matter of fact, when he saw the father looking over the hill every day, the older brother got madder and madder. The older brother said, huh, why is he wasting his time on him? Why, why, why is he doing that? I'm, I'm here. I, I'm the one he should be looking at. I'm, I'm the one that he should be longing for, and, and so he gets more bitter and, and, or, and, and, and bitter. Now, now listen, that, that, and I don't know if this is true with you, but I'm just telling you, uh, I've been around the block a little while, and, and, and every single time, every single time that we start putting an emphasis in our churches on lost people, Every single time we start trying to stretch out of our comfort zone and say, hey, man, let's open up our doors. Let's do something. Let's do celebrate recovery, and we have one too, and I love it. Or, or let's do what, what the preacher's wife was talking about today. Hey, man, let's, let's start welcoming people in the parking lot. And by the way, one of the greatest ministries we ever started at our church was a fit team, a first impression team. Because I'm telling you, way before the announcements are made or the song is sung or the preacher preaches, all of it begins in the parking lot. And the bottom line is, Disney doesn't need to be the happiest place on earth. The church of the living God ought to be. All God's people say it. And I'm telling you, you need to go to that lunch or breakfast or whatever it is, and you need to say, count on me. And some of you say, well, that's just beyond me. I, you know, wh wh what is it good to open up a door or somebody? Or we don't have a parking problem. You missed the point. It's not having a parking problem, man. It's just setting an atmosphere of we're glad you're here. We thank God that you're here. You're, you, and we're, 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 we're ready for you. And you are a guest, and we've been prepared for you. That's, what it, that's, that's, that's the difference that it makes. And every single time the church starts trying to reach out the lost people, there's always a group of people that raise their ugly head and they say, well, what about us? 
Don't forget about us. Well, this is the older brother syndrome. That's what that is. The older brother should have thanked God that he had a father that loved his younger brother so much. But no, he said, what about me? You can give me a fatty calf. And by the way, I want you to notice the two nevers that the older brother said. You see in verse 29. Well, we already talked about the first one. He said, I never transgressed you at any time. But look at the second one. Now listen to this. And you have never given me so much as a young goat that I make me merry with my friends. Oh, is that so? Is that so? How soon we forget. You say, preacher, how, what, what are you saying? Go back to verse 12. You have your Bible. Go to Luke 15, verse 12. This might blow your mind. Listen to this. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. Luke 15, 12, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between who? Them. Them. And in other words, the older brother got his at the same time. And, by the way, let me remind you, being the older brother, he got twice as much. He got twice as much. Oh, how soon we forget the grace of our Heavenly Father. That's the older brother syndrome. And those of us that have been saved a while, those of us that are faithful, those of us that are sticking by the stuff, those of us that come on Sunday night and Wednesday night or whenever, you know, th those of us that serve and those of us that, you know, that, that do and give and all of that, we've got to be careful. But there is a way out. There is a cure for the older brother syndrome. Now, I'm going to finish up with this. Uh, I want you to see how the Apostle Paul, uh, by the way, wouldn't you agree that the Apostle Paul was an older brother? Wait, here's a man that wrote, wrote uh, 13 books out of the 27 books in the New Testament. Wouldn't you agree that, that he was probably an older brother, that, uh, that he'd been around the block? Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree that um, you know, he'd been beaten, shipwrecked, uh, put in prison? For the cause of Christ? Wouldn't you agree that if anybody, if anybody had ever felt entitled, if anybody ever said, hey, look at me, look at what I've done, it would have been Paul. But he never did. And why is that? Well, Paul tells us. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, uh, by the way, Paul, Paul was saved, we believe, around 36 A.D., uh, not long after Jesus resurrected from the dead, you remember Stephen uh, was stoned, and, and, it, and they laid their coat at Paul at Saul's feet. Saul, Saul was in charge of that. Uh, you, you know, stirring up a crowd, uh, that's nothing new. He'd been doing that as old as time, and Paul was the one that stirred up the crowd. By the way, Paul, or Saul at that time, he was the original religious terrorist. That's who he was. And so he came to know Christ around 36 A.D. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, listen to this. You, you don't have time to turn to it, but listen to this. Uh, he, uh, 20 years after he'd been saved, 20 years after he'd started churches and taken missionary journeys, listen to what he said. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he said, I am the least of the apostles, and I'm not fit to be called. That's what he said about himself. Now, this, this is after knowing Jesus for 20 years. Uh, and by the way, uh, because it's in Scripture, we know it's true. He's not fishing. He's not fishing for compliments. He honestly felt this way. Now, the reason why I know this is because it's in Holy Scripture. The Holy Spirit wrote that. Uh, let me give you an example. The book of Num uh, Numbers, uh, the, the, the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 12 and verse 3, it says, Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. You know who wrote that? Moses. So he had to be, he had to be under inspiration of, of the Spirit of God. So they really felt this way. I mean, this, he's not fishing for government. He said, I am the least of the apostles, and I'm not fit to be called. Well, you go down to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8, seven years later now, with all that Paul's gone through, he reevaluates his life, and he says this, I'm the least of all the saints. 
You see, he's reevaluating himself. He said, I'm, I used to think I was the least of the apostles. But come to think of it, after being saved for 27 years, I'm really the least of all the saints. But he's not through yet. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, two years after that, uh, right before his death, he's reevaluating his life again. He says, you know what? I'm the chief of all sinners. And I mean, he used to think he was the least of all the saints. Uh, uh, I mean, of the apostles, not worthy. And then he, then he said, I'm, I'm the least of the saints. He said, but no. A- after I've been saved about 30 years, walking with Jesus, then I realize I'm the chief of sinners. I'm not worthy. Now, how in the world could a guy who done everything that Paul did Every, everything he'd seen, sacrificed everything for the cause of Christ. How in the world could he remain so surrendered and so yielded and so void of pride? Well, he tells us. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, look at what he says. For I determined to know nothing among you except Christ Jesus, and him crucified. In other words, Paul said, look, I saw Jesus on the cross dying for me, and I never got over it. And the same cross that saved me is the same cross that keeps me every single day. And brethren, and sistering, if that's a word, if we would do that, we would avoid pride, self-righteousness, and the older brother syndrome. May God do that among us. Trading Ford Baptist Church and our sister churches here tonight, for all of us who have been saved a while, may Jesus get us back to the cross, get us back to the cross, and that will keep me yielded, that will keep me humble, and that will keep me close to you. Would you bow your head, please? With every head bowed, every eye closed, every head bowed and every eye closed. Devin, I'm going to ask you just you just play whatever God has laid on your heart to play. play and I, and I'd, I'd like for us all to just stand. You've been very patient. You've been sitting a while. So would you just stand? But would you keep your head bowed and your eyes closed? And the, the message tonight is certainly for the church, for all of us. I, I asked you this morning uh, how many of you knew you didn't deserve it. You wasn't bragging on yourself. You're bragging on Jesus, but you knew that heaven was your home. And just about everybody raised their hand. Thank God for that. And I believe you were sincere. I believe you. And we had some that, you know, struggled with. They got saved this morning. That's awesome. But for revival, if God's going to take this church to another level, first of all, you've got to want him to. You have not arrived. This is a great place, but you haven't arrived. The church I pastor, I love my people. I've been there almost 30 years. I love them, but we haven't arrived. We ain't even come close. I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I, I don't want a church that looks just like me. I don't. And I do everything I do, even keeking and screaming, to make sure that we're reaching out to sinners, to people that are nothing like Jesus and nothing like us, to let them know that Jesus loves them. And what Jesus did for me, he will do for anybody and everybody that calls on his name. What about you? Who here tonight would say, Brother Jeff, I, I've been saved a while. I know Jesus. I know heaven is my home. But I want God to keep me sweet and to keep me surrendered and keep me yielded to avoid self-righteousness and pride. To help me to avoid the older 
brother or the older sister syndrome. May my heart be hot for Jesus and open to people that are not like me. The sinners that are out there. The people that are hurting. The people that are mocking us. The people that are laughing at us. You see, they're broke. If, if my watch broke right now, you think I'm going to fuss at it for being broke? No. I'm going to try to fix it. Why are we trying to clean our fish before we catch them? It's ridiculous. Let's be a church that's open to anybody and everybody that would call on the name of Jesus. Would you do that? Anybody here tonight and say, Preacher, I'm asking Jesus, help me to avoid it. Keep me close to the cross. Let me see Jesus every day dying for me. Because I once was lost, but now I'm found. And what he's done for me, he'll do for anybody and everybody that would call on his name. But they got to hear about it. they got to know about it. That's my heart's desire. That's my prayer all over the building. Raise your hand up. Come on, hold them up. Keep them up. Amen. Many hands. Come on, I'm going to ask you right now. Make your way to this altar right now. Would you do that? While Devin plays, just come on. Older brothers, older sisters, come on. Let's, 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 let's just tell Jesus. You're not making a commitment say, I'm going to do it. Just say, Jesus, this is my heart. I don't want to be caught in that trap. I want to be thankful for what the Father does in our lives. I've got a good, good Father. And I, always wanna, I don't ever want to forget it. I don't want to forget it. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Don't look at who's coming, who ain't coming. Doesn't matter. It's between you and God. This message to the church. Lord, help me. Hey, folks, I'm almost 65 years old. I'll be 65 in just a couple of weeks. And I'm telling you right now, my heart breaks for a younger generation. My heart goes out to a younger generation. My heart goes out to people that absolutely don't know anything about the Lord. And I want to reach them. And it's, it's the definition of insanity to say, let's just keep doing what we're doing and expect different results. Can't do it. Are you open? Lord, help me. Help me to avoid been an older brother or sister entitled this is not my church this is your church and I just want to be a part of you building your church in and through my life maybe you need a church family maybe you need a church home if I lived up here I'd, I'd, I'd come to this place I can tell you that just come to the pastor and say pastor I'd like to be a part of this church family they'll take care of the rest of it I don't know what you need to do. But don't walk out of here the same. Not when the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to us in such a marvelous way.